Okay, I'm going to begin now, and I want to thank you all for contributing and helping my um, helping me do my work. And I very, very, very much appreciate it. Uh, tonight's program, uh, we have Paula Lozano uh, from Lakewood, Ohio, is our my co-host, and Pip the Wonder Puppy is somewhere here, but she doesn't want to be shown tonight. And this is the week. Oh, I wonder what that weird there. Um, uh, this is the first time I am publicly showing this little person who is Walter Geraci Erickson. Oh. Someday I will get all this straight, but I'm just wanting to show the active speaker, but for some reason it's not showing me. You'll have to trust that I'm the one talking. Um, but this is Walter, and he is 18 days old today, and he lives with us, uh, which is why we're being extremely careful about uh, getting any germs here, so we're following all these rules. Um, Paula, see if there's a way you can turn off the sound for the, the doorbell. Uh, tonight's program, we're talking about migration strategies, ways different birds get from here to somewhere else. And we're going to talk about several elements of it, um, why they migrate, where they migrate, how they migrate, when they migrate, based on the 24-hour clock, when they migrate based on the 12-month calendar, and how do we know what we know? And then, I can't see the bottom of that, who? Who migrates? So the first question is why? Why do birds fly south for the winter? If you were a Boy Scout who got Boys Life magazine, you know the answer is because it's too far to walk. But they actually do want to leave where they bred for a good reason. Birds are usually well prepared if they have time to grow new feathers to survive severe temperatures. Uh, that's not the reason. The reason is those severe temperatures change what food is available. So that birds that are um, trying uh, to eat flying insects can obviously not find them on a day like this picture is showing. Uh, this is a barn owl that turned up at the Saxon Bog this January, was there for a few days, and then finally just collapsed in the snow and ended up dying before the birders who observed that could get him to a rehabber. It was pretty heartbreaking. This little teeny tiny bird, the common red pole, has been shown in laboratories to survive colder temperatures than any other bird, um, including ravens, any other songbird. There's probably a few um, I don't know why it's not showing me. I feel like you should at least be able to see me, but I just cannot figure out how to get my name there, my picture there. Oh, well, anyway, where, uh, uh, so the uh, birds leave because ice is covering the fish that they need to get from the water, cold temperatures are keeping insects away, all the things that they need um, are not available and the birds that need those things have to leave. Um, so where do they go? All over the place, but they stay in our hemisphere unless something really screws them up and they end up like 
on a ship that's going to uh, east or west and they end up in Asia or in um, Europe. But they, some birds go far, some birds don't go far at all. And they just are all on the move now. How do they migrate? Some of them flap the whole distance. Some of them um, manage to take advantage of thermal air currents that hold their bodies uh, aloft. And some of them will just take short flights over a long period of time. Some take very long flights on a few days and otherwise they, they are not on the move. This is Duluth, Minnesota's, uh, the time of sunrise in the morning is this line here. And oops, and the time of sunset is this line. And as you can tell, um, right around January 1st, the sun is rising just barely before 8 a.m. And it's setting not much after, uh, before 5 p.m. And the days are getting longer as of January 1st. Uh, the sunset is getting later. And then here's where the sunset is the earliest it is, and that's around the solstice. And then, day, then the sunset is getting later before January 1st. And sunrise is the same way. Birds can feel and see when the sun rises in the morning. And um, if you notice, this is not perfectly even. The earliest sunrise is earlier than the latest sunset. But birds wake up and their internal circadian rhythm is slightly less than 24 hours. And if it's already light when they wake up because it's lighter than it was the day before, they think cool. And that actually gets their bodies ready to do whatever they have to do by the season. This is today, September 1st. And we can see the days are getting shorter. That space between the two lines is way less than it was here at the longest time around the solstice. But we aren't quite at the point where it's the same in Duluth, Minnesota, as it will be in um, every other place on Earth during the equinox. But birds can sense that day length. So we, how do they know where they're supposed to go? Some of them learn the route from their parents. These are whooping cranes who were raised in captivity and are learning the route from people wearing whooping crane costumes that the birds imprinted on. They think those are their parents and they're flying all the way south uh, following an ultralight aircraft. That experiment started in 2001 um, or 2000 and um, it ended after a while, but the cranes that made it south to Florida from Wisconsin, it took them like two months to get there, that first flight, because they could only fly when the winds were favorable and it wasn't raining. They were extremely weather dependent and the birds had to flap the whole way, which was very, very difficult. And so they couldn't cover nearly as many miles as they could when they went back to Florida. When they went uh, back to Wisconsin in the spring, they made the trip sometimes in three or four days, what had taken two full months 
to do going south because they would leave when the weather was right and they could cover hundreds of miles instead of 40 or 50 or 60 miles in a day. So, um, we're, as we get into the who migrates, we'll talk about different species that learn the route versus know the route, but geese and swans um, are like cranes staying with their parents. Also swallows, many swallows stay with their family as a unit as they migrate. But some birds have the route already in their little tiny brains. Back in July, the first male ruby-throated hummingbirds, the male adults, started getting ready to migrate. When they were done being needed to mate, they just started moving. And the adult females were still raising young. They couldn't leave yet. We were still seeing male adult ruby-throated hummingbirds in July and well into August. But many of the ones we were seeing now were ones that came from further north and were stopping at our feeder on their way. The females have to wait until their babies are fine and independent. And then the females are usually pretty depleted and it takes them a while to build up their muscles to get back in uh, and get enough fat on so they can migrate. And the last ones to go are the babies. We could be seeing all three groups for much of the migration though, because as our birds leave, ones from further south replace them. But that is entirely in these birds' brains, so the babies do not need their parents to know when to migrate and how to migrate. It's pretty miraculous. How do they find their way? Different birds use different cues. They use one cue, the same as ship captains, they use star patterns. They don't have a nice little star map and a navigator who tells them, but when they were tiny babies, they were watching the stars in the sky. They would wake up at night just like human children do, would look up at the sky, and over the night, they would observe that when they looked up this time, all the stars had moved except one star and that star they learned as north and it's going to be out when we get to how we know what we know i'll show you how we figured that out they can birds that migrate by day can use the polarity of sunlight and i do not understand this but wherever you are on the horizon depending on the time of day the sun's polarity shifts and birds have an internal circadian rhythm so they know what time it is without even wearing a watch. And based on the time, they can figure out where on the horizon they should be headed to go somewhere. They also have little bits of magnetite in their brains many species that tell them, uh, that detect the Earth's magnetism the way our compasses do. And they did elegant experiments about this back in the 1940s and 50s. A guy named Keaton at, um, I think he was at Cornell, uh, what he did was used homing pigeons, made these funny little helmets for them, Half the birds got helmets that were magnetic. Half of them got helmets that were exactly the same weight, but not magnetic. On sunny days, if they released the pigeons, they all immediately went home. It didn't matter what kind of helmet they had. But if it was a cloudy day, only the pigeons without magnetic helmets found their way back. As soon as the sun came out, 
the other pigeons found their way back too, because it turns out they're using that polarized light. But they also have this backup compass and the compass got messed up if they had a magnet on their head. When do they migrate on the clock? We have birds that, my, that are fly-by-nights. They just migrate at nighttime. There's real advantages to going at night. The temperatures are cooler and wind speeds average lower. Hawks do not migrate or hunt by night, except ones like peregrine falcons that hang around the Empire State Building and hunt for the birds that are drawn into the lights. They can use the stars for navigation if it's not too cloudy and they can't see their food in the dark anyway, so they might as well be using the nighttime to move and the daytime to feed and rest. Then there's the day trippers, and these are blue jays moving by day here. There's real advantages to flying by day. You can take advantage of thermal air currents and updrafts that will keep you aloft, and then you can be losing altitude as you're moving toward your destination until you catch another thermal that will lift you again, and then you will cruise again. And the only birds that can use that are ones with very big wingspans and relatively light bodies compared to their wingspan, and so that they can ride those currents. If your food source can be seen from above or in your airspace, you can stop whenever and wherever you want. So you could be moving by day and looking down and seeing a whole big bunch of berries on the top of a tree you're passing over and go down and pig out and then go back again. Also, when you're flying around in daytime hunting insects or birds, you might as well be hunting while you're going the right direction. And the, advantage, the other advantage to going by day is you can sleep all night. Then there's the birds that don't seem to care if it's day or night. Robins are those fruit eaters and they'll stop, they can migrate hundreds of miles in the daytime stopping when they see a good source of berries. But they also are nocturnal migrants who can also make long flights at night. When on the calendar do birds move? The season starts at the end of June when uh, shorebirds from way up in the Arctic tundra start moving down after they've had their very rapid uh, nesting season. The day length above the Arctic Circle is pretty much 24 hours. They can feed that whole time, be feeding the babies that whole time. So they have a very, very compacted nesting season. They're, they get up there, they pick their mate out really quick, raise their babies really quick, and head south again. So they're the first. Nighthawks start going in August, usually right around my grandson's birthday, August 14th. And hummingbirds are going in July and August. And warblers start moving. I was getting warblers in my yard coming to my bird bath starting at the end of July. Then we get blue jays. They're going in, usually they wait a little bit until September. And just yesterday, I watched one of my adult blue jays feeding one of my baby blue jays from this year. The baby looks like an adult now, but um, they're still staying with their family and the babies can still mooch for food if they feel like it. Broad-winged hawks are starting to move. Usually I don't see big numbers of them until mid-September, but this year a lot of birds do seem to be moving a little earlier than normal and uh, they're flying through. 
then robins, we get our huge numbers at the end of September, beginning of October. And then we start getting more and more of the pine siskins and goldfinches and little finches that are heading south. Uh, then we start getting goshawks in late October, November, and swans are going in October and November. And uh, then we get the, the cold winter finches and we start getting owls, usually not until December and January. And when boreal owls start moving around, that can be way even in February, though that's not a true migration. That's more of a um, uh, just moving around trying to find food. It doesn't have to be north or south. How do we know what we know? That's the coolest thing about bird migration. Um, we scientists, this picture I took at Cornell, are figuring out the coolest things about bird migration with high technology, but a lot of stuff we know or we started out knowing came about with much lower tech methods. The first way we know that birds are moving is by watching them. We see, if we go out every day, we see different birds on different days and we start realizing, huh, they came here from somewhere, they're going somewhere. You can actually watch migrating birds by watching the moon. If you use your eyes, you're only going to see birds that are flying at very low altitudes. If you train a spotting scope on the moon or manage to hold your binoculars very steady, then you start seeing tiny specks going by the moon. If a warbler is up 2,000 feet and it's very tiny to begin with, it's going to be a tiny speck and some of them can fly even higher than that. And so you need magnification. And people figured out long, long ago what percentage of a line through the, um, the horizon the moon makes and can calculate out how many birds are flying in general based on how many are flying past the moon. We can count birds along flyways. And here I am counting hawks and also songbirds at Hawk Ridge in Duluth. This was back in the 1990s. And I had an assistant who you might be able to see down here. This is a nighthawk named Fred. And he would count with me. He could not fly. And when the sun was shining, he usually had stepped out of that uh, pet carrier. But when a red-tailed hawk or a peregrine falcon flied over, all of a sudden he'd go rip, 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 rip. And looking up, so sometimes he could pick out birds way higher than I could see. And his rip, rip, rip told me to look up there, but then he would turn tail and go into the carrier. And then little by little, he'd come to the door again when he thought the coast was clear. Uh, this is Bill Evans from Ithaca, New York. Bill figured out um, how to recognize the different sounds birds make in the sky as they're migrating. All these tiny little birds flying up in the sky are making little call notes. And they're making them to each other probably for two different reasons. One, to avoid mid-air collisions with each other because they don't have headlights. And two, because just hearing each other helps each bird make sure they're going the right way. And so it probably is a signal that this is a good night and this is the way we should be moving and it helps keep them from colliding. Bill developed a website, um, I don't know if it's still active, called oldbird.com, I think, oldbird.org or oldbird.com. But he 
has directions so you can set up a microphone on your roof wherever you are that will record the night sounds and then he made software to analyze it to figure out who all is flying over in all these different places but that has his research back in the 80s he would come to Duluth sometimes and sit with me when I was counting birds at the Lakewood pumping station when he was figuring out all these bird songs and it was pretty amazing we know a lot of what we know from banding birds um, just the act of trapping the song sparrow tells somebody where a song sparrow of this bird's age and sex, well, you can't always figure out the age, but where it is on a particular date. But cooler, there's a very, very tiny chance that somebody somewhere else will trap this song sparrow with this band on it, and then we will know how long the bird has lived since he got banded or she got banded. We will know how long it took to get from A to B if they were, if it was captured twice in the same season. We can learn where they're wintering sometimes and all kinds of information. Uh, there are so many birds banded and only a tiny percentage of them get recaptured, but the more birds that are banded, the more recaptures there are. Okay, this is how we found out about birds using stars and birds using magnetism. We would raise them in these cages, which are called emlin cages and there would be like iron filings or ink on the bottom and the bird over the course of the night when it got restless would start moving up one side of the funnel or another side leaving ink behind and people could see where it was concentrated to get a sense of what direction the bird was trying to go um, planetarium studies they showed and that's how we found out that birds recognize the north star and the way they figured it out was by it was a planetarium and they could rotate the stars however they felt like so they started uh, moving the stars around betelgeuse and the indigo buntings raised under those conditions all oriented toward Betelgeuse, not toward the North Star. Forest birds don't see the whole sky. So it's amazing that they manage to figure out where that fixed star is. But over the night, over 24 hours, this is what happens. And that one star is what the birds fixate on. So their first fall, they're not flying toward north. They're flying away from north. They're orienting, going the opposite direction. In spring, they're going toward it. Okay, we know about bird migration, the timing, and all kinds of things because of radar. This is a NEXRAD radar map. Back when they first started looking at these, uh, they were trying to pick up weather patterns. They noticed that often right after sunset, they started getting these like bursts that had nothing to do with weather. Here is a weather system. Here is a bird system. And it took a very, very clever person studying radar for the military, Sidney Gotro, to, who figured out, whoa, these are birds. And figuring that out, he managed to see big movements of birds going over the Gulf of Mexico 
And he's the one who figured out that between the uh, around 1960 and around 1980, the number of migrants going over the Gulf of Mexico declined 50%. And then he discovered that between around 1980 and around 2000, it had declined another 50%. So that's pretty distressing. We know a lot about bird movements now. We can get like amazing, precise information by putting satellite transmitters on them. Putting satellite transmitters on common loons from Minnesota and Wisconsin, we know that a great many of them fly to the Gulf of Mexico. And when the satellite transmitter suddenly stops transmitting or just stays at a single spot, we know that that bird died and they can retrieve it because they have a location. And uh, that's how they also keep track of botulism outbreaks in the Northern Lakes. They use RFID tags. That's the exact technology that you have in your car if you can go through um, uh, toll booths and it sets off so that it knows you paid. Um, chickadees don't, aren't big at paying at toll booths, but at Cornell, it's almost impossible in Ithaca, New York, to see black-capped chickadees that aren't carrying a lot of hardware, including those RFID tags. They do studies of them. They can put a reader, like is in that toll booth, at a bird feeder or a bird nest, and they'll know exactly when each bird that is wearing one of those tags enters and leaves, and they know the birds individually. So they've learned a whole lot of stuff, mainly about local birds, but it's pretty amazing. Geolocators, this is Bridget Stutchbury, who became famous because she figured out how to put these little teeny tiny geolocators on purple martins and then on thrushes, which are way too small to put a whole radio, a satellite transmitter. These do not tell you exactly where the bird went. But they, they record, they have a tiny chip that records the day length, sunrise and sunset, wherever the bird goes. And then the next year when it returns to her nets, she can uh, read it and find out what the sunrise and sunset were all along, and that can tell her where the bird was. And it's really an amazing little system, but because of her work, we can find out precise information, not as precise as with the satellite transmitter, but way better than before we had these. And um, it's really cool research. Now there's also the MOTUS wildlife tracking system. And I'm not sure if they use the exact same RFID thing, like these are all these little toll booths, but people have to have readers and then they can recognize the birds wearing the right little chip um, from pretty far away from each of the towers or antennas that they're trying to find those chips from. <clears throat> The, uh, all these dots are where they have one of the antennas. And we're trying to get more and more and more and more localized so we can find out small pictures as well as big pictures about it. People monitor lighted buildings and find dead and injured birds. Uh, the program started in Toronto. It was called the Fatal Light Awareness Program. And they started retrieving birds that had collided with windows. Um, they would collect piles of dead birds. They would rehab the ones they could and release them. But they're the ones who initially got 
building owners interested because of all the public pressure they put on them uh, to start turning off the lights at night on tall buildings. The birds were colliding with them uh, and the ones that didn't die when they fell to the ground in the morning when they're hopping around some downtown and came to a bank that had a big you know, plant in their lobby, they would try to go through the window to get to the plant and be killed by their low windows. So um, monitoring lighted buildings has become a really, really important thing. Lights are so bewildering to birds. When they're, um, the times they get killed most are when there is uh, too much cloud for them to see the stars. But if they get anywhere in a lighted space, their eye pupils do exactly what yours do in the light they contract, and then it's too dark to go back into the dark space. And so they mill around the lighted space and crash into the whatever the building or tower is or into one another, and it's a horrible mortality. But uh, so buildings take out a lot of birds. Um, the two um, on the bottom, the red start, and I think that's a Tennessee warbler, collided with a, it was a brick building. It looked like it was out of uh, the far side. There's a cartoon where a building is solid brick with a little teeny tiny window. And uh, the uh, bird, hits that window and it says when birds hit the, uh, the window of vulnerability. And that was pretty much what that downtown building was. And these birds, their bodies were still warm when I picked them up in downtown Duluth um, early one morning. It's heartbreaking, it's such a waste. A lot of birds that ended up in downtown Duluth that were still alive but had, were in um, in a dazed condition, came to the Erickson Rehab Center where my daughter was very helpful. But look at the carnage that lights out Toronto. That's what they would do uh, once they'd retrieved all these birds. They saved them over the season because it's heartbreaking and sobering and made people really pay attention. But other cities are starting to do this too now. Uh, Chicago has lights out, Minneapolis, uh, a lot of big cities do now. Towers, the lights on communications towers also kill a lot of birds. And Dr. Charles Kemper is one of my heroes of the universe. On September 20th, 1957, at one single TV tower in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, he tallied 20,000 dead birds. And on September 19th and 20th, a two night weekend in 1963, 35 thousand dead birds. Um, I happen to be, I think, the only person ever to get a, a, a tower construction proposal right outside Duluth stopped. They were planning on building a 300-foot lighted tower with guy wires. Guy wires, it, birds have trouble seeing, and the lights actively attract nocturnal migrants. So the guy wires presented a huge danger to flying raptors, and that was right along the Hawk Ridge Flyway. And then at nighttime, all the warblers would be attracted to the lights and get killed. And so uh, they ended up building a 100-foot tower a uh, wood pole cemented in the ground for a cell phone tower back in, I forget what year that was, like 86 or 87. Um, but yeah, it was really 
Um, but since then, the cell phone uh, companies, uh, the communications towers companies, and also wind farms hire one um, scientist uh, who will say whatever they pay him to say. So it's very frustrating because now he um, gets to uh, pretend like all these birds dying at towers are no big deal. Okay, so who are all these migrants I'm talking about? There are 10,000 species of birds on earth, roughly. About 1,800 of them 18% are long distance migrants. Why are most of them, the vast majority of them, breed in the north and go to the tropics? There's very few that breed in the south and go north to the tropics. The reason for that, just look at the shape of the continents. We have this huge area of Europe and Asia, we have this huge area of North America, and then they go down to the tropics for the winter. Look at the tiny area of, uh, I mean, there wouldn't be that many birds breeding there to need to go down to the tropics. There are some southern birds that migrate north for the winter to the uh, tropics or subtropics, but it's not very many. I love starting with the oven bird because that's one of my favorite birds and it's one of the birds that gets killed in the biggest numbers at towers and lighted buildings. It's a long distance migrant that goes from this brown area down to the blue area. Some of them winter in Florida, not very many. A lot of them are in Central America and Mexico. Uh, but for some reason, they, and they, they also are one of the warblers most likely to collide with our windows on our houses. And they're not a feeder bird, so it's not our feeders that attract them. It's kind of a heartbreaking thing. Here's another one of my all-time favorite birds, the red-eyed vireo, and that's another one that, like the oven bird, is a nocturnal migrant and gets killed in huge numbers at uh, lighted structures and towers. And they're going, uh, the yellow is their, their migration route. The red-eyed vireo is going all the way to central South America. That is a long way to go. Here's a, a warbler, the little yellow rumped warbler. This is a mixed up crazy bird. It has longer intestines than any other warbler. And that is a really lucky thing because that means it can digest berries which other warblers can't do. That's why it's called the myrtle warbler because it eats a lot of wax myrtle berries. They, um, some of them come to feeders now and it's actually become quite a thing up here. These are all yellow rumped warblers. This one was a weird leucistic one. Uh, but they come to suet feeders now in big numbers some years. I didn't get a single one at my feeders this spring, but I think I took this picture last fall. This one was at one of my mother-in-law's friend's houses when my mother-in-law was at a card club. And they, uh, up here we get these things called cluster flies. They're like house flies that just crowd into people's windows and um, uh, on the inside. And so I was swatting the flies in the house, would shovel up a handful of them and put them out there. And it was waiting for me to come out with the flies. It was really pretty cool. Some of these guys, these yellow rumps, go all the way down to Central America, way down to Panama and, and Costa Rica. But some of them winter really far up, like in Maine, because they can eat those berries. 
uh, they will be split, the myrtles, from the Audubon's warblers eventually. They, they, it's unquestionable that they're different species. The only reason they haven't already been split is that there are two more populations that they're working out to see which they belong to, and then they'll split them. But the yellow-rumped warblers, I just love when they come through, uh, but they have a huge winter range because they have, uh, they can eat insects, they can eat flying insects, and they can eat berries, and they can eat suet. The American woodcock is another one of my favorite birds. I would ha have a very hard time figuring out who my favorite birds were. Uh, these guys are just so cool. They are one of the slowest flyers in directed flight, uh, but they're harder than heck for hunters to shoot. They're a popular game bird. Uh, they're, not, they're not going long distances. They are a nocturnal migrant, and many of them are found in those buildings. Um, you, know, uh, you know, under buildings when uh, lights out, people are going and finding dead birds. Uh, this purple area is where um, they can be found all winter, and then the blue area, uh, the purple area is actually all year. They can be there, they can breed there, and they can winter there. Uh, the beautiful, beautiful hermit thrush. They're another uh, nocturnal migrant, and they're one of our later, that's the, this is the latest thrush to migrate, except the robin. Uh, the other uh, Calfaris thrushes are going much further to Central and South America, where this one is only going to the Southern United States, and then some go down into Mexico and a little bit into Central America. But they are, um, just a beautiful, beautiful thrush. And they're a nocturnal migrant. And they get killed in big numbers in the dark. I didn't even know what warblers to use. I love the chestnut-sided warbler because even though it doesn't look anything like it looks in its breeding plumage, it's very distinctive because it's got that like tropical yellow color that is just really cool and they have that beautiful little eye line, eye ring. But they're going all the way to Central America and the bottom of um, Mexico, and they are one of our, uh, I see the most of them here at the very end of August and the very beginning of September, and then they're gone, except they breed up here, so I get to see them in the summer. I'm talking about the ones that, that come to my backyard for um, bird, to my bird bath. The black pole warbler is a very interesting bird. It, uh, here it is in the fall. Uh, the only way you can tell that this is a black pole, not the only way, but the, the best way, uh, to know it's a black pole and not a bay breasted in its fall plumage is by looking at the feet. And uh, it's the one with the pale feet, despite its name being black pole. Uh, if it had black feet, it would be the bay breast. The, uh, this is where they breed. This is where they're passing through and they're going all the way down to South America. And what they do, most of them do not go through here. Some of them do, but a lot of them go to the coast and then take a nonstop flight over the ocean down to South America, which is really amazing for a bird that weighs less than an ounce. Here's Kirtland's warbler, one of my favorite birds. Um, they breed in Michigan. It used to be they only bred in the northern part of the lower peninsula of Michigan. A few of them now are up in Ontario and up in the upper peninsula. And now we also have a, a, 
a small population in Wisconsin. But you can see where they breed and they winter down in um, the Caribbean. And um, they're, uh, they're endangered, but their numbers are doing much, much better than when I started birding. I remember 1976, that was my um, second year of bird watching was the United States's uh, bicentennial, and it was the state of Michigan's centennial, and they were calling the Kirtland's warbler the, cent uh, the bicentennial bird because they wanted to get the population up to 200 pairs, and now there's well over a thousand. Cedar waxwings are mainly day trippers because they're looking for bugs. They are the world's most sociable birds. They eat berries and bugs. Uh, they'll come down to berry trees today. My neighbors have a buckthorn, which is a horrible tree, but birds love the berries and then the birds eat them and plant them everywhere else. Uh, we've tried to keep the buckthorn completely gone in our yard and We've pleaded with our neighbors to get rid of the buckthorn, but um, that's what the waxwings were at today. Um, but they uh, can be found even in the winter in Duluth. Usually Bohemian waxwings outnumber them here, but they can be found through this huge swath of area both breeding and in the winter. And then here's where, where the rest of them uh, go in the winter. They can just do whatever they feel like. Individuals will stick around further north and some individuals will go way, way down to Panama. And this is nature's perfect bird. This is one of my baby blue jays this year. Um, like I said, I had a family yesterday where one of the parents was still feeding one of the babies even though it's full grown now. Blue jays are strongly migratory, as this map does not show. We get big numbers. We can have days where well over a thousand blue jays pass along the shore of Lake Superior. We've counted them. A lot of people have tried to figure out what makes blue jays migrate when all winter, there's no retraction. There's, if you can see it there in summer, you can find at least a few in winter. But a lot of them do move south and nobody knows what the trigger is. Uh, they've tried to correlate it with acorn crops because blue jays are acorn specialists. They've tried to correlate it with the weather, but it's like the blue jays just have some secret communication system and decide, let's go somewhere this year or let's stay home this year. Ruby-throated hummingbirds are like so cool. The vast majority of them go down to the Gulf of Mexico. If they're in good shape, they take off first uh, at mid morning, they pig out and then take off over the Gulf of Mexico, nowhere to feed or rest until they get to the Yucatan Peninsula during hurricane season. The ones that aren't in as good shape will mosey along the coast of the Gulf, but it's much shorter and simpler if they're in condition to do it, to go straight that way. It's really pretty astonishing because male ruby-throated hummingbirds weigh about one-tenth of an ounce meaning you could mail 10 of them with a single stamp. They prefer air mail. Broadwinged hawks are migrating right now. I took this picture uh, Sunday 
in my backyard. A broad-winged hawk had come down and was eyeing my baby bunnies, which I did not approve of, but what can you do? I have a lot of baby bunnies. Uh, but they are going all the way down to Central and South America. Now, this is one of the only uh, budios that specialize on hunting in woodlands. Most budios hunt in open country because they want thermals to hold them aloft. They have these great big wings and this big wide tail that, and they don't weigh much. So these thermal air currents can bring them way up. They have to move forward, but they move in a circle. So they rise like they're on, you know, a spiral up and then they'll lose altitude cruising till they find the next thermal. And that's, their budio wings are perfect for migration, but in their day-to-day -day life, they hunt from perches and just drop down and get their prey. And so they can make this long, long flight and they do all their flying on a few wonderful days when there's good thermals and only hunt when they come down at the end of the day. And then they might be stranded in a place well, while it's rainy for four or five or six or seven days before they can move again. Sharp shinned hawks are hunting birds on the wing. They can, and some of them stop in Wisconsin, the ones that we see at Hawk Ridge. We've had banded ones that we've caught in Wisconsin in the middle of winter where they were recaptured. We've also had them in virtually uh, every country of Central America. We've had returns that were banded at Hawk Ridge. All they have to do is go where the birds are. So if they specialize on robins, they don't need to go too far. If they specialize on warblers, they probably do. And robins, speaking of them, this is another bird with a lot of different foods it can eat. It can eat worms, as we know. It can also eat a lot of fruit. And it. Uh, uh, the main things that I see them in my yard for are fruit, they nest here and they love my bird baths. I have more pictures of robins at my bird bath than any other species except squirrels. But the robins are a short distance migrants. Some of them are only going down there. We get some, this should actually show Duluth in the wintering range because, but in winter, they're not eating worms. They're strictly eating berries. And it's not until worms start becoming available in the spring around the 37 degree average between day and night that they start moving north. How do you tell the last warbler of winter from the first, uh, the first last robin of winter from the first robin of spring? When it sings. That's what tells you it's a spring robin. Nighthawks, we had a pretty good migration of them this year. And they're flying through. They're, a fly, they're one of those, uh, does anyone really know what time it is? Like the robin. The robin can go by day or by night. Nighthawks start out in mid-afternoon when there's a lot of dragonflies and other insects. And they're slowly working their way south but they're mainly hunting. As, we, as it gets later and later in the day, they get higher and higher in the sky. So I think by dark, they're still going, but way high up, and now they're just flying straight instead of chasing bugs. But I have rehabbed a lot of nighthawks. That was the bird I specialized on. And they're just passing through the yellow is their migration. They're going all the way to South America for the winter. Canada geese are another day or night bird. They can migrate by night. You could hear them up in the sky and you can see them by day. And they, there used to be um, way more of them that bred up here 
than in this purple range. Now they're breeding all the way down to Florida, which is astonishing. That would not have been in a range map when I started birding. And that's all I have to say about that. Uh, next time on um, October 1st, the program will be How Birds Prepare for Winter. And the November program, because my birthday's in November, I decided to do it on one of my favorite groups of birds, the woodpeckers. So any questions? Now we'll open up. I have to figure out how to get video going again. There, here I am. <laughs> I don't know why that was not showing me before. So uh, I will try to unmute people so everyone can. Oh, was that just one person? How do I do? Paula, Paula, unmute yourself so I can tell what's going on. OK, so you hear me? Yeah. OK, so I see you. I see Walter um, in the chat. Uh, it still says privately, I just asked a question, do you put out food for migrating birds? And that's the only one I see in the chat right now. Hmm. Uh, repeat the, the, that uh, question, because I'm trying to. Okay, you ready? Yeah. So from Rebe Rebecca asks, do you put out food for migrating birds? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, what I do, uh, we can get bears in my neighborhood, which are not fun. Um, all kinds of uh, weird, um, there's good reasons not to subsidize the wrong birds. Uh, we've had rats in our neighborhood. I used to scatter a lot of white millet on the ground, but then they started doing horrible construction projects in downtown Duluth, and suddenly the rats abandoned ship and spread out to the city. Now it's not been too bad, but my neighbor had one last week, so um, that was pretty frustrating. Um, but so I don't put seed on the ground as much as I did. I'm very careful when I have a good sparrow migration to only set out what they're going to eat that day. And because the rats tend to come by night. Um, and um, so I like feeding the sparrows coming through. Uh, the way I feed my wax wings and uh, robins is by having native fruit trees. Uh, we have mountain ash and dogwood and some things like that. Um, and then unfortunately, a lot of my best pictures of my fruit eating birds are at my neighbor's buckthorn, which is terrible because buckthorn crowds out native fruit trees. And the worst thing about that is buckthorns only has berries for a short window of time. And it's crowding out things that would be providing berries over a much bigger window of time. So that's a very frustrating thing. Um, I feed suet when I have Warblers, uh, the only one warbler that comes to suet normally used to be the pine warbler, and it would just be one individual, maybe half the years. But now I get these yellow rumps almost every year in big numbers, uh, which is kind of bewildering, but cool. Um, what else do I, uh, when I get the catbirds coming, if I don't have too many wasps, I put out jelly for them. And um, uh, catbirds, brown thrashers, Cape May warblers love grape jelly. And they also love oranges. I put oranges out in the spring and uh, the grape jelly. But if I have problems with um, uh, too many yellow jackets or things like that, I bring them in. I don't leave those out in the summer because um, there's enough natural food and I don't like 
birds to feed their babies stuff that isn't very nutritious. And baby uh, cat birds are like children. They like their food very sweet. Um, so I'm trying to think, and then I feed the hummingbirds and never ever use red food coloring in your hummingbird fluid. It's bad for them. Any other questions? You could either type it in or um, is unmute there, themselves or unmute yourself to ask the question. The only other thing that we had was Tom Maloney um, put in the chat that the uh, the the address for oldbird.org. Oh, good. So www.oldbird.org. Thank you, Tom. It's uh, oh, how uh, how does a bird orient if it's too far south to see Polaris? We don't know because the birds we're studying in North America are the ones that can see the North Star. I'm and there aren't that many southern migrants. Uh, so that's an interesting question. The one bird I know of that I've seen in Costa Rica that migrates um, south to north has the backward migration is the piratic flycatcher. Okay, so we have one comment here from Carolyn. She says we can't unmute. Oh, can you? Uh, okay, mute yourself if you don't want to be on. <clears throat> if you don't want to be muted, mute. If you don't want to be able to talk, mute yourself so that we don't hear too many people breathing. But Susan had something she wanted to say about bird banding because she does a lot of it. Hi there. Um, I live in St. Louis County in Missouri, which is always fun since Laura lives in St. Louis County in Minnesota. Um, yeah, sure. I, yeah, yeah, sure. You betcha. Um, I belong to a bird banding team at the World Bird Sanctuary here, and we band songbirds in spring and summer. And then in the late fall and early winter, we band northern saw wet owls. And when we started that maybe nine or ten years ago, we weren't even sure if they came this far south. But yes, they do. Well, a few years ago, we caught a saw wet owl that was already banded. Um, it, it has become our, our silly practice to name the birds we catch, A, B, C, D, E, F. This bird just happened to be there on F night, and my, my uh, fellow teammate named the bird Frankie after her granddaughter, Francesca. Well, when we went to the computer and looked up this bird's band number, we learned that it was banded in Duluth by your friend, Frank somebody. Frank Nicoletti. Frank Nicoletti. And so we thought that was cute that the bird that Frank banded ended up getting the name Frankie in Missouri. Yep. And it was so cool because it was banded in St. Louis County and it was retrieved in St. Louis County. We've also caught one that was banded in Ontario. Ooh, cool. Um, I, yes. I have a question. Is that all right? This is sure. Jenna in I, Providence. Yeah, I'm just, it floors me to see how many, well, even back in the 60s, or you said something like 60,000 birds were killed by a tower in one night. Yep. And how, one tower, not even a tower farm. But I, it just, I'm like, how is it possible that so many birds, um, you know, get born and survive oh, each, during their breeding season each year. It's, Does anybody know how many birds there are in, you know, obviously the numbers have gone down, but every year, how many birds are, are there? <laughs> it just, um, it just floors me, the numbers that get killed, how, how many must be produced? 
Um, the, uh, the American Bird Conservancy has really good data on their website about the numbers of individual species. Mm -hmm. um, it's, you know, billions of birds, but it's um, one of the things that frustrated me when I started doing my radio program back and when we moved to Duluth in 1981 and then I started doing my radio program in 86 is that we, um, so many birds died at my windows and the other people that I talked to. And I couldn't get any scientist to take that seriously except Dan Clem who is the one who did the seminal research on window kill, uh, window collision mortality. And also, I was trying to get support to get Duluth to pass a cat leash law, and none of the organizations with their conservation biologists would help because they said cats kill individual birds. They don't affect populations. But they weren't paying attention to how many individual birds were killed by cats. It took yeah, Dan no, how do scientists say that? Mm -hmm. um, but when um, one when plus I, one plus one plus one plus one. Yeah. When I wrote my book, 101 Ways to Help Birds in 2006, there were several conservation biologists who hated it because I focused on things people can do um, from keeping cats indoors. Um, if you live in a, a city in a tall building and you have your lights on at night, close the drapes. And if you're, okay. it's a room you're not in, turn the lights off, uh, do things like that. But they said I was making it sound like birds were declining more rapidly than they are. Uh, Sidney Gotro, when he did that research about birds going over the Gulf, he was poo-pooed by so many biologists. And then just this year, they suddenly are saying about the billions of birds that are, you know, that bird numbers are a billion mm -hmm. less than they were. And they're acting surprised when people who've been paying attention who were in trying to get grants knew that all along. <laughs> so I know, just when you look at, read uh, like Audubon's um, accounts of his walks across what what was you know the country at that time and the it, and i look at the trees now you know in a forest or wherever and you just think it was it's hard to imagine what it was like when he was alive you know yeah. the millions and just a totally different world now and i, mean, and I can see the di diminishing diminishment in birds just over sh relatively short periods of time and here the in Providence. The, the frustrating thing is those of us who have birded for several decades, we remember more birds, more waves of warblers in the spring, bigger waves of warblers in the spring. And people say, oh, that's just selective memory, but it isn't. And now we're finally finding ways of figuring out. I mean, one of the things I've been complaining about for decades is how few flying insects there are now compared to the 70s. My husband and I, when um, I took my first ornithology class at the Kellogg um, Biological Station in Kalamazoo, Michigan, we had to, uh, to drive there at four in the morning to get me to my class at six. And uh, we would have to stop two or three times on that drive to use our snow scraper to get the bugs off our windshield. And you don't have to do that anymore. And it's heartbreaking. That's what fueled nighthawks. That's what fueled mm. purple martins, both their migration and when they got to their destination. And those insect numbers have tragically and definitely declined. 
Yeah, I think there's, there was a study I saw, you know, estimating the biomass of insects globally. Yeah, and exactly that, the biomass has diminished very significantly over the past, I don't know, 20 or 30 years. One, still... cool, one cool study looked at um, a chimney swift tower that had been closed down back in the 60s. So the swifts were using it, but people weren't cleaning it out. Mm -hmm. And they did core samples of the chimney swift guano poop. Oh, and they could go decade by decade through the poop and see how the insects had changed and they could correlate it with when DDT started being started oh, really? and things like that. It, it was amazing and, and frustrating that it's been so hard to get people to take this seriously. Yeah, I remember the, the bug splats on the windshield whenever we used to drive from New York down to North Carolina when I was a kid, but mm. no more. Somebody asked about the Bohemian waxwing migration. Michael did. Um, and we get Bohemian waxwings in Duluth. We used to get hundreds. I've had a thousand Bohemian waxwings in my yard together in winter uh, back in the 80s. They've declined. I don't know if their overall numbers have declined, though I suspect they have, but their winter movement patterns have definitely changed. So now there can be days when the cedar waxwings outnumber the bohemians here in Duluth, which never used to happen. Um, but they're a more of a Western bird and they just kind of roam. They're very nomadic and they roam throughout the Northern part of the, the continent and they'll head wow. East during the winter. Uh, but, but they're Bohemians. So it's hard to see a pattern. <laughs> oh, so, so, uh, so Paul, Oh, wait, I think I said it now so people can unmute themselves, right? Well, yes, we figured it out. I, you know, there's still a lot of people who are muted, but I think just go over how they undo, how they do that. I think I uh, had unmuted everyone, and they, but they could mute themselves, okay. I think. But I don't, um, I'll do that again, but then you can mute yourself again now. I'll make sure so anybody who was trying to be heard could be heard. Um, Val, uh, my friend Val Cunningham asked, what are some of the big questions we still have about migration? Um, trying to understand what birds are feeding on during their flights. Uh, we can watch the nighthawks eating dragonflies here, but what are they eating all the way down to South America? Uh, uh, just all kinds of things like that. There's so many conservation questions about migration, what's fueling them. Um, I think the biggest question is what the heck can we do to make help people make their windows be safe for birds? That's a, a huge question. Um, we don't know um, how the different things, for individual birds, they found magnetite in the brains of lots of little birds. Um, but they've also, uh, when they studied them in the lab, have found that birds really use the stars. Is the magnet like, your little um, $5 LL Bean magnet uh, compass that you use when you can't uh, see where the stars are, nobody knows. Uh, they know they use those in some combination. They figured out with the pigeons, it was the polarized light was more important than the uh, magnetite because all the birds found their way if it was sunny. Um, so, but there's just so much to learn. There's always going to be questions and nobody still knows what told the wild geese it was time to go. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Laura, I have a question. Uh huh. Um, I don't know if you heard about our excitement here in Rhode Island over the summer with the three nomads that came over from Eurasia. We had a Tarek sandpiper. We yeah. had a little stint and a redneck stint. Wow. Three All in the same place. <laughs> I wonder if they have to, uh, nobody knows if they have to ship or what. And we don't know. But it's cool that they hung out together. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, I met your question right now. Uh, when we get these lost birds, um, it reminds me of one time a Blackburnian warbler ended up in Great Britain. Um, Wow. which it certainly didn't belong in. And it, so it was a big excitement for people. But I wrote about it in my first book. And the night before the book was supposed to go to the, pub, uh, to the printer, the publisher noticed that in that section, I'd said that even with the finest navigation system birds have, a, a bird sometimes screws up. And he got so offended by that naughty language oh, no. <laughs> that, he, that I quick had to find a better word than screws up because <laughs> he said his parents would be horrified. Uh. <laughs> Any other questions? We're actually going to have champagne tonight. Um, celebrating the new addition to the family. And he went to the doctor today for his 18 day appointment and he had gained um, 14 ounces. So my daughter was relieved. <laughs> He's only nursing. So it's kind of scary because you can't see how much they're eating. And he doesn't spit out the huge streams that our kids did. So I, we couldn't judge by that. <laughs> yeah, embarrass your daughter way. Yeah, yeah really. <laughs> well, thank you, Laura. And does anybody else have any last minute questions? I can't thank you guys enough for supporting my work. I really appreciate it. It's wonderful. Well, yes, thank, thank you very much. Yeah. Congratulations you. and thank you so much. And I will try to be less sleep deprived next time. <laughs> <laughs> that comes with the territory. <laughs> yeah, so we we're so lucky because they were in Brooklyn and it was too scary with mm, uh, yeah. COVID-19. So they uh, uh, quarantined here for two weeks back in April. And then we've been one happy family. Uh -huh. and it's worked out great. It's great. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for coming. And I will try to record, uh, the, to, I hope my recording turned out and we'll try to get it up. Thanks Thank very you. much, Laura. Thank, Thank you. you. Great Thanks, to Laura. Thanks. Good night, everybody. Good night, everyone. Good night. Take care. Love Skull. you. Love you, too. <laughs> Debbie. <laughs>